we're going to talk about basically a practical way to commission a system. So, you know, you can get in the weeds with task groups and all this kind of stuff. And Mike is going to come here in just a little bit and we're going to talk together. But um, the best thing is to kind of characterize your clinical use of the system. You want to, you know, test things you're actually going to be using clinically. So that makes your testing a whole lot easier if you can actually quantify that. Um, <clears throat> but we are going to go through the double APM kind of recommendations of what you should do. Um, you know, again, it's always nice to check the box. You want to make sure you're doing everything that they recommend. But um, but really, this is going to be kind of heavily guided by end-to-end -end testing. So, you know, an end-to-end -end is essentially, all it is is just trying to quantify the way you clinically use the system from start to finish. That's, that's what you're wanting to do. That's what you... Um, and, and there's different situations we're going to talk about as well. Um, and ultimately, we're going to establish some baselines for that QA. So that's the, that's the recurring testing you're going to do. Okay. So it's easy to kind of get swept up and everything, you know, but back to basics, acceptance versus commissioning. Like, what, what's the difference? Why do you want, you know, Vision IT comes out, they do testing, you have a phantom, you're, you're showing the system does this, you know, uh, within specs. Is that enough? Well, maybe not Not really. It depends on what you're gonna be using it for, you know? Um, it doesn't take into account specific clinical workflows, you know? Um, there's been many talks talking about um, different, you know, extremities or SRS or treating a trigem. You know, those, those things all have their own clinical baggage with them, right? So you need to test those things out as well. Um, interfacing with systems. It's not necessarily, you know, given that a certain vendor software or with another piece of vendor software it's not the vendor's fault either that's something that's on the physicist to be able to kind of show and prove and going back to mike's talk earlier it, you have to be able to kind of hold the vendor accountable to make sure these things interface correctly that's part of commissioning as well um and, and treatment planning processes so you know showing that something from ct can be accurately delivered on the, on the machine that's that's pretty much the ultimate we want to check so what's our guidelines? Um, well, TG147 has some very, very good surface guided uh, optical tracking guidelines. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. TG142 is the general QA guidelines for all machines. So we're gonna talk about those as well. And again, just cause it's not in there doesn't mean you should do it either. It, it, you have to have some sort of onus as a physicist to realize, oh, there may be above and beyond or maybe combine some tests and just knock it out cause it's not that important, right? Um, you'll, you'll know that by walking through your workflows. So kind of a, just a, a quick rundown of what 140, 147 says. You want to check integration. You want to check spatial reproduci reproducibility and drift. You want to check localization. Um, you want to look at all the documentation that you have to provide um, and set procedures. So what's the best way of creating an efficient procedure? Because, again, you can get caught in the minutia, right? You can go down and be like, well, I have to do this particular test. Well you don't really have to. You can combine these things in a way that makes sense. And that's kind of where end-to-end -end testing is so important because you can essentially create a test to check the SIM, to transfer the orientation and the scale of the machine. Is that Because we actually went through a scale change on two of my IX machines just about two weeks ago. And so we had to adjust the LiDAR-T software to account for the scale change, okay? So these are all things that have to be taken into account. So how do you do that you know, efficiently? And that's the end-to-end. -end. So the end-to-end -end concept is essentially making workflow from start to finish, like a patient. From, it's, it's not rocket science. You really just want to take a phantom, and that's kind of what we need in our arsenal is a good phantom, um, you know, make a realistic treatment plan um, to be able to handle that. There are kind of multiple cases, though. So it's not as simple as just saying there's one size fits all. Um, so I broke them down into two categories. One's static, one's dynamic, okay? It is the patient breathing is it a head <laughs> is it is it stationary that's an easier test right um you just take a you know, any head phantom or any sort of phantom you want put it on the table and check it out um dynamics different right your sbrt the patient's breathing um how what's the latency there's gonna be a lot of beam holes there's gonna be a lot of things that are gonna affect the beam so what do you want to test on that so before you do this though you do want to make sure that you have a great baseline right so you want to establish uh a good Winston Lutz test. You want to establish. You have in, you know coincidence on that. Use the align RT cube. Establish that. 
before you start doing any of these tests. All right. So static, um, that's the max HD head phantom we have, um, and then a compass mask. We actually did it, you know, to the T, like we would treat a patient. So open mask design, made it on the phantom, um, went through. And again, it helps show what people are talking about. We don't have the advanced uh, calibration right now. So we do see a little bit of a walk, okay? So what that helped us do is to say all our SRS cases that we're doing, we see a 1.1 millimeter walk. Okay, well, that's known. That's a known issue. So going back to all these talks before, we can correlate and establish that. The only reason we could do that is because we had an end-to-end -end test that showed that. Um, you know, six stop correlation. How are your rotations doing, right? So if, if for some reason, and you can actually use this to kick it off purposely and bring it back, you know, test those kind of positions. Um, stability, look at drift, you know, keep the cameras on for an hour. See what happens when you come back. These are all easy tests to do. Um, set it back up, put it back together. So those are all satisfying a lot of those TG147 requirements. You know, those things, I say requirements, the recommendations really, but you know, th those things you wanna check the box off of. And again, you want something that's gonna be realistic. You know, um, ideally you, you have, and a lot of people have had slides up on anthropomorphic head phantoms. Um, that'd be my, my preference. Um, cubes don't really work, right? So. Um, I've seen in the past where you take the, the, the cube, you rotate it, it's symmetric, right? So it's, it's tough for to quantify the system based on ROI, based on, you know, the fact that people have different ROIs drawn. You won't see that on a cube necessarily. Um, so, you know, many commercial phantoms are available, especially if you're getting the system. It's peanuts compared to you just bundle in the cost, just buy it. Um, you need to have it. Um, film, chambers, OSLs can be put in these phantoms as well um, to do dose symmetric analysis. Okay, so basically, and, and again, we're going pretty quick because we don't leave a lot of time for Q&A, but static end-to-end -end testing is really, really simple. CT it, you plan it, you send it over via DICOM, you set it up via CBTT, and then you capture that reference surface to correlate that to where you can actually quantify the walk. Again, it's always going to be a little bit, two-tenths of a millimeter, something different between a DICOM surface and, and the actual CBCT. So what you really want to check is not that. You want to check to see if those, those mechanical parameters are transferring properly. Okay? So then localization, you can move the phantom at will, pre-prescribed rotations. Um, you can look at occlusions that are more of an issue with our version than if you have the advanced camera optimization. Um, and again, all these tolerances are tying into TG142. So these things kind of guide you into what your machine capabilities are going to be. And every machine is different. And we saw earlier about couch walkout, right? It's, you got to do, do the test, do due diligence, walk, walk it through. Um, yeah, and, and, and you know, stability is easy test. Just let it run, see how it walks. Reproducibility, take it up, put it back down. You know, test that over and over again, see if you have the same results. Um, these are all tested in 147, that's why I'm going through those. Um, dynamic end ends are a little bit different, right? And this is something that a lot of people don't do, but I would highly recommend. Um, you know, get a motion phantom of some sort. You know, most, most variant machines come with a little RPM block and um, you can use it with that. Ideally, you would get something more along the lines of a, uh, uh, you know, quasar phantom or something like that. So you can actually have some dosimetric uh, results, but you know, Again, if you have nothing, just move the couch, hold the beam, see how that affects. Because again, we all trust that when it says beam hold, that it's gonna do it. We don't know, right? Is the radiation actually being turned off at the same time? So let's quantify it. So TG142 uh, talks about, it's like 100 milliseconds, something like that, on the on latency. So try to quantify that. Um, it's tough, that's a tougher test. But again, we use it for SBRT a lot. So this is one of those things to where we're trusting that that that, that gating is, is happening correctly. So um, go through that as well. And again, all this is back to end to ends, right? So we're not gonna go through with a stopwatch necessarily. We're gonna take a phantom, we're gonna deliver it, look at the results at the end. Um, there's a lot of good data coming out from uh, Vision RT system as well, which is kind of what I'm talking about. I mean, I don't know, I can't speak to other SGRT systems, but um, that data comes out in a nice text file. You can actually read the data, import it into Excel, um, look at that. Coming out of TrueBeam or coming out of the IX um, machines, you do have the log files that come out as well, so you can look at those. And, and again, it, it's one of those things you just try to replicate the situation, what's going on. So you think about it clinically. Um, ideally, you have a motion phantom to do it, but if you don't have it, 
you can get around that. Um, spatial accuracy is another thing that you want to look at. You want to look at displacement, right? So, so if something's moving in time, you want to make sure that at that moment it hits that threshold, it holds it. So not just about it, what's happening on the, on the back end, you want to actually see if it actually can track that reliably. Okay. And ultimately, it's vendor recommendations too, right? You want to make sure that you're doing what the vendor says. Um, you know, in this case, you're talking about daily, monthly QA, using the plate correctly, using the cube correctly, um, and document. You know, I've done about 120 true beams commissioned. You know, it doesn't matter if you didn't report it; it didn't happen, right? So you have to make sure you document your results. Um, so just kind of write that up and make sure you have those on file. It's like any system in radiation therapy, right? So SGRT is no different. You want to treat it just like any other system you have. Um, again, there's, you know, this idea too of reoccurring baselines, right? So you want to make sure that what you did at commissioning, or we say commissioning, but whatever process you went through, you establish at a baseline, use those recurring. And Mike can talk about it more because he has really good processes in the clinic for that. Okay. So... Again, it's a crucial part to commission a system. Um, it, it's it's one of those things where it's not necessarily you know widely known how to do these kind of things, um, but but it's kind of what you do for every system in radiation therapy. You just you go through and think about how is this impact to the patient. Let me test that from start to finish. Um, combining this procedures makes it really easy. You can a static kind of situation where you're just doing tracking and monitoring. Probably bang that in a day. It's not, you don't have to do a 20 month long process to figure out how to do this. It's, it's pretty easy. Um, specialized phantoms are available, so use them if you can, you know, get the capital for it. And um, yeah, and just, again, make sure people understand what you've done. I've, I've done consulting work all over this world. You know, the biggest pet peeve of mine is walking in and not knowing what somebody else did. So just, you know, document it, have the courtesy of making sure everybody understands exactly what you did um, for the system, but yeah. And I might come up here in a second. Honestly, the, the, we wanted to leave a lot of time for questions because especially yeah. like last night, you know, I talked to quite a few individuals last night as well. Uh, and there's lots of concerns about what does it mean to QA these types of systems. Um, one of the big questions that I always get, and, and, and Jonathan actually touched on it, is the latency test. Um, how, do you, how do you do that for an SGRT system? Oh, this fine gentleman right here. Not that I don't love Jonathan, uh, but uh, we, yeah, we don't need to be this yeah, cozy not, up not here. Not too close, not too yeah. close. <laughs> <We had laughs> Thank you. Time last time. Thank that's you, right. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's an issue for some folks to kind of understand what that latency test needs to be. Um, w one of the recommendations I have is, it, because SGRT says, woo, okay. Uh, <laughs> sound instantly more powerful when that happens. Um, when people are doing that latency test, there's multiple ways you can handle that. The, TG142 does talk about, um, I believe it's 100 or 200 milliseconds. Uh, your true beams, if you have true beams, I can't speak completely to the, the exporting data from an elective machine, so most of my stuff will be around true beams. Uh, but the true beams, you're getting stuff out every 20 milliseconds. There's really interesting things you can do uh, if you can correlate what's coming out of the true beam with what you're seeing on your uh, SGRT system. Uh, one really interesting thing I'm trying right now that I, I don't quite have a solid procedure on yet is you can basically use, if you have developer mode, uh, th those of you who have it, you can use the true beams table as a motion phantom that you don't have to buy, uh, which is fantastic because now you're getting the real time positional output in the, in the uh, trajectory log file of the table position. So what you can do is you essentially set your tolerances on uh, the SGRT system to one millimeter. And then you program up your uh, developer mode plan that basically programs in a sine cube offset to the table vertical. And you can move that table up and down. And now you get one of the nice features of the, the, the trajectory log file is you get the beam on off yeah. trigger as well as the position of the couch. So you can move the couch up and down, allow the SGRT system to trigger at your tolerance. If your tolerance is two millimeters, it triggers at two millimeters. The latency between when the couch position is reported as being outside of that two millimeter reference position and when you see the trigger signal is an exact measure of latency. It is the only true exact measure of latency that I can come up with. Uh, everything else relies on correlation between the SGRT output mm -hmm. and either film or the actual physical uh, output of the machine. 
if you do it in that way, what's nice is you get latency in 20 uh, millisecond increments. And yep. so you can measure it extremely accurately. So if you have a true beam uh, and you're a better developer mode programmer than I am, you can come up with some really slick stuff and you can test it in all six degrees of freedom as well, which is nice. You can move the couch laterally. Uh, I've programmed the couch to travel in a circle uh, in Ooh. some sort of ellipse with a long offset as it goes around. And so you're getting like an ellipse in, a, in kind of an elliptical pattern, but in the long lat and vertical. And so you can look when those, those couch parameters are actually physically out away from your reference position by your tolerance. And if the beam off is not off, as in the treachery log, you can get 20 millisecond increment values for your latency. Yeah. You can do it with film. I don't know, do you do film we've latency done, tests? We've done film as Okay, well. so yeah. there's a trick you can do with film where you have two bars. Um, you basically irradiate statically two bars. Mm -hmm. You leave a one millimeter offset between those two bars and you deliver a field in between. So as you're testing your latency, that one millimeter bar based on the mo speed of your motion phantom, you can figure out what the time is to traverse a, a millimeter. And then you just have it turn on, the beam on and off yeah. to that film. And you're basically delivering a dose between two other dose distributions. You take a profile between them and you better see a gap. If you don't see a gap, you have a latency problem. Right. But you have to do that on an SGRT system with different surface resolutions and different ROI sizes. Because like Jonathan was saying, I know you guys do a lot of SBRT with it. We do yeah. a lot of SBRT with yeah. it. And every SBRT, ROI is not the same you, and every yeah. surface is different. And so there's a lot of extra things that go into latency testing. And that's, that's an example of a, a really common question that we have uh, that I got last night actually. So um, without me yammering on and Oh, and tying back to Mike's point on that, um, the development license costs is about as much as a motion phantom. So you get a nice quasar fully loaded, you about had the same cost for that license. And I have BMXML code that I've written. I will gladly give it to anybody. <laughs> um, that if you want to use it. Um, and the nice caveat to that is you can automate your just QA in general. Um, you know, you can use this thing to do way more. So if people need that, that's, that's a really good recommendation to go that route. Um, if you have a true beam. IX, sorry, out of luck. But <laughs> a true beam, it's good. It's, it's really good. So, so. All right. is anybody in here, uh, how do I put this? A, a new user, like you just purchased a system and you're kind of going through that process right now. Sometimes there's people here that are actually going through the process. No. And you're all, wow. oh, there it is. Okay. So what tests are you doing? I'm going to put you on the spot. I get to ask you questions. <laughs> That's right. Uh -oh. I totally flipped the tables on you. You stepped right into it. <laughs> oh, you're not using it yet. Are you, in, are you commissioning it right now, though? Oh, so it's an existing system. That's another common thing. The, the folks who went to the training are probably not there anymore. Yeah. I feel for you. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch, that's harsh. But... Yeah, you walk in and they're like, we, <laughs> yeah. these things hanging from the ceiling, we don't know what to do with them. Uh, yeah, and I think ultimately this whole, the whole, Mike's talks are really good. I, I'm a fanboy, I listen to all of them. Jonathan's um, really good for my self-esteem. Yeah, I am, I try, I try. <laughs> but it, you know, I actually used to work for Vision RT back in the day, right? I was their physicist, um, you know, about, what was it, Norman, about 10 years ago? Wow, that's, God, that's a long time ago. Um, but, you know, and going through these kind of iterations, one thing that, you, the, the feedback that as a community we give, because what we see directly impacts what they develop, which is great. Um, you, you know, I, I think it's one of those things we've seen lately, right? The advanced camera optimization, I'm, I'm intrigued now. I'm gonna be on the phone tomorrow trying to get it in my system. Because again, people are seeing certain things, we quantify them. The only way you quantify those is to test it, right? If people didn't do these detailed analysis and tests, we never would see that, right? And so that's kind of one of those things where as a community, it's very important just to kind of, you know, sometimes people think of commissioning as some sort of big thing, again. I did 120 true beams over a course of five years. It's not that big of a deal. But you need to have some sort of guideline. And, and we're here, we're available. Um, so you got like 100 emails last week, something like that? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so, so share the love, email me too, it's fun. But, um, but I think, yeah, I mean, as far as just starting out with the system, yep. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if this is my job, but. <laughs> Mike, would you describe your uh, camera block test that you do? Um. Yeah. Uh, the camera obstruction test at my center, we run it every day because we do a lot of SRS. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, if you're going to use triggered imaging like we did in my first talk, uh, where we had lots of questions about triggered imaging, uh, you are extending the arms 
during delivery, so you are gonna obstruct the cameras much more often. So what we end up doing is, uh, to Jonathan's point, we like to combine tests. So one of the rules I have in my clinic is I can add as much QA to the therapist as I want, as long as I keep morning QA under 45 minutes. Uh, that is a deal we have. And the other deal is every time I add QA to my therapist, who, whichever physicist comes up with his wild, awesome idea, he gets to do morning warm up for a month. Um, and so that one keeps the modification down to a minimum because physicists don't like to get up that early. Uh, but they also run that QA, which drives efficiency. So I, I did not get my physique walking in and out of the room a lot. Um, so I don't like to go in and out of the room a lot. So when I come up with a test, I come up with a test that sounds good in my head. And then when I have to actually implement it in practice, I want to basically refine that test. And so our obstruction test is actually tied into by talking of combining tests right. into the TG142 test that I can almost guarantee, I won't bet my paycheck, but I can almost guarantee everybody does. You, you do some sort of cone beam CT localization in the morning to do your TG142. Can I get, yes, if you're not <laughs> nodding. There's a camera and we're gonna call you later. Um, but if you're, if you're already doing a cone beam, you already have the arms out, you're already doing all that test already for your therapist. Yep. One of the nice things to do is we use uh, the new cube from Vision RT as part of our morning warm up, um, is it has offset ISIS in our location. So what basically we have a plan at each one of the balls inside of the Phantom. Uh, we pick a random ball, ball two works really nice because then you can use all the automation from outside of the room. But physicists found that out because he had to walk into the room. Um, but you, you basically align to the offset ISO center. You have that plan on the true beam. You have that plan in a line RT. You're testing your MMI interface. You're testing all that interface. And so while you're doing the cone beam for your TG142 test anyway, we have an ROI that we basically analyze the OBJ files uh, for all of our SRSs. And we look at the surface area uh, of a standard ROI per se for, for our clinic. So we know roughly how big that ROI tends to be on average in our clinic. We put that ROI on the cube and we're actually live monitoring the cube while we're doing the cone beam CT to move the cube for TG142. That's all being dumped out to a real-time delta file. And so now I know every single morning that there's no obstruction characteristic on my camera because as I go around, I have the arms out already. I'm obstructing both cameras as I go around with my cone beam CT. And if I don't see any offset in that real-time delta file, I know that everything's okay. About two months ago, we started seeing this random lateral offset all of a sudden when, when the if you visualize, if you have a variant LINAC, when you get to basically gantry head 30 in an IEC coordinate, the gantry head is in one position and you have your KB panel in the other position. And now you're blocking two cameras and you're relying only on the forward facing camera. And what all of a sudden started happening out of nowhere, because we statistically trend everything in my clinic for the most part, we started seeing this weird lateral offset just peeking out there for about 15 degrees of the gantry angle until that panel got passed and we started seeing a, an image from one of those lateral cameras. And what it was is we just had a small issue with the foot of couch camera. And we actually saw that in another QA we do that just because we're monitoring all the time, we were seeing an offset in the morning from the daily QA. It had went from, well, I think a 10th of a millimeter to two tenths of a millimeter is the standard R RMS for our daily QA. And it jumped to four tenths of a millimeter just for that camera. And we don't know if someone dusted the camera. And, and when I say dust in my clinic, that's beat it with a stick every <laughs> night. Um, our cleaning crews are, <laughs> Not, not necessarily gentle with all of our equipment, but somebody adjusted the, that camera just ever so slightly. So if you're, if you're combining these tests and you're looking at the output on a, a much more um, frequent basis, uh, which is why we like to add a lot of QA to our therapist in a, an efficient fashion in the morning, because you think about what we do as physicists, we, we talk about we do QA in a monthly standpoint. We do an optical Winston Lutz, which is, I, I really liked Paul's talk. We yeah. do an optical only Winston Lutz every month. But if I'm trending four data points, or I'm sorry, 12 data points over a whole year, what statistical significance do those 12 data points really get me? But if I have that, the therapist do it every morning as part of an efficient test that's already preloaded on the, on the true beam, I'm actually trending 250 data points. So I find little tiny issues that I can agonize over and lose sleep over, you know, much quicker, which, you know, my wife loves because I just stay up all night worrying about what's, what's the next thing that's going to break. Um, but it's one of those things where it, the more data points you can get, the more efficient you can be at combining your tests. Yep that obstruction test, I'm already doing a cone beam. I'm already blocking it, just like I'm gonna block every SRS I'm gonna do all day long. Why not record that, those values and use that as my obstruction test instead of waiting for a month from now, doing an obstruction test on my monthly and then saying, oh, that's weird. I've had an obstruction characteristic problem. I wonder how long that's been there. Right. And so um, being really efficient at those tests, like Jonathan was saying, as far as combining all of those tests together, really gives you a lot more data points to really 
fine tune and do QA on your system. Um, there's some really interesting like open source libraries if you're prone to programming that like I am um, that can use AI and a, a couple of other things to kind of analyze things and use smart testing and tell you, hey, this is kind of abnormal and send you an email or something. So uh, I, I tell everyone, as part of like all my talks, everyone says, well, you do a lot of stuff. And I was like, well, they say, you know, what is it? What's the mother of all invention? Necessity is yeah. the mother of all invention. I, I, I disagree. Sorry. It's laziness because I just don't have the time to do all that stuff. So if I can automate laziness. as many things as possible, we found an offset in our cube calibration phantom that's an artifact of the virtual phantom offset. And it's because I have a new physicist and he's going through our processes. And so he doesn't do them the way I do them. And last week he's like, I've got an error. Uh, we have one OSMS system that's not uh, maintained uh, by Vision RT. So that system tends to be one of our problem sites because it's not as well looked at all the time. And so he was saying, we have this weird longitudinal offset and I'm starting to see this QA problem in the morning and the analysis is showing a one millimeter offset every time we go to 90 degrees. And, and we don't typically go to 90 degrees. We, we go out to like 45 in the morning checkout because we want it to be quick and rapid for the therapist. We don't rotate the full entire couch, but he's at a site that does tri -gym. So now he's doing the full couch. Rotation. And if you rotate the virtual phantom inside of the Align RT software, there is no back face because you typically don't look at the back of a phantom during delivery. So you don't really see this during delivery, but if you're doing a QA that's a little bit atypical and you go to 90, that open face on the back of the virtual cube will give you an oscillation in your long because there is no face for the camera to actually lock onto. And so it's a combination when you obstruct one camera and you have an open face on a virtual phantom that you're not used to looking at, you'll get a, a strange little longitudinal offset. And so that was something we, I mean, I've had the system, like I said, for many, many years and had not seen it, which actually prompted my question to Paul because we're going to include that in our QA now because it's something that I completely just, uh, it, it didn't come up. But as you add things to your process, you'll see little things come up and you kind of have to take notes on that and kind of look at it because we're seeing now by adding more of a top of the head type of ROI, at least to our QA, all of those offsets go away. And so we know it's an artifact of the fact that the virtual phantom in the cube calibration software doesn't have a back to it. You're never gonna use the back of the phantom for cube calibration. But if you're using your QA inside of that workspace, you'll see something like that. And so. The discussion of the, the styrofoam head and the painting of it uh, reminded me, we've tried to do some some various clever end-to-end -end testing using existing equipment that we have. Right. And the cameras are very sensitive to the color of plastics, the, the re reflectivity of things. Have you found any clever coatings, paints, ways of uh, getting the cameras to be sensitive and not noisy to blue plastics, brown plastics, those sort of things? So outside of the commercial Phantom, um, what I did at one of my clinics was went and got a you know went to Michael's got a styrofoam head phantom all that stuff it did a flat like peach kind of color onto it it worked really well um again the key to all this kind of stuff too is the ROI which Paul was talking about earlier that's very sensitive as well but as far as getting the get it to track well that that worked for me that was about what five bucks um to do that again there's no dosimetric you know measurements that I could do on that but uh, at least it, it allowed me to track so all could talk to that as well. I talk into the box? Yeah, I talk to the box. <laughs> talk directly into the, the box. If it talks back to me, I got a problem. <laughs> um, so uh, the styrofoam phantom I bought um, actually was off the internet. I think it was 10 bucks. So it's for holding um, wigs. But then uh, at first I started um, just using it as it came. And there were two things about it. First off, it's bright white. So it just reflects all the light. And it, the surface is, uh, at least the one I had, was quite, I would call it granular. It had crevices in it. So um, I did a lot of measurements with that original $10 Phantom. Uh, and then after talking to Ben Baghorn, he said, you know, Paul, you might want to try to modify that Phantom um, color-wise and texture surface texture. So um, I did that and the surface texture, I got rid of the crevices. Okay, everybody hang on. Okay. I actually used 
uh, flour and water. I made a paste uh, that I painted on uh, five coats and it filled the crevices. Um, I was afraid I would get mold, but I didn't. Right. And then the color, uh, you mentioned pink or uh, peach color. Actually, that is uh, right out of Home Depot. It's uh, acrylic paint. And um, I kind of went with one of my wife's, um, I don't know what you call it, the surface stuff they put on. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I, I don't know. Yeah, foundation. Foundation, okay. And, uh, and I said, that's the color I want. And the guy mixed up a few things, and I bought a small amount and uh, painted then that uh, kind of fleshy, uh, what did you call it? Foundation. Foundation. <laughs> and uh, after a couple of quotes of that, then I did all, uh, all those measurements again. And indeed, uh, then uh, I, my errors were uh, somewhat smaller, not greatly, what, what do I mean, a couple tenths of a millimeter. And uh, overall, I, I felt that it did improve it. Um, so that's my comments about phantoms. Now, as far as what's available commercially, um, uh, I've I, there's with, lots of stuff out there. Lots. Yeah, I've worked with a lot of vendors because we, we do a lot of beta testing of materials and things for some phantoms. And so each time they send me a new material in a block, uh, we run the same optical test on it as well, just to let them know how is this going to fit into our, because we're, we're very heavily, if you haven't noticed, um, relying on our SGRT systems. We set up our QA phantoms with it. We do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. And so when I'm doing evaluations of new materials, new solid water watercolors, or you know, I've, I've got this new material, I want, acrylic I want to make this out of, I, I tell them, send me a 15 by 15 by about three centimeter sample of it. And we monitor that with the cameras. And just also when we're evaluating it, we also provide them with the data of how well this will operate under service guidance just as a, a courtesy to the vendor. Uh, so they know if they're going to be making something in the future out of this material and the center has optical guidance in the system as far as within their treatment system, how that phantom may respond based on that material characteristic. I find that the system that we have is, is relatively robust against lots of different materials. Um, I don't see lots of offsets related to, like I've used the, the Max EI back there is made out of uh, a blue material. Um, the, the Max HD that he showed in his talk has like a gray surface texture. Um, I've done them on like rando heads, which are almost black on the outside and had pretty decent uh, results with that. Uh, the darker the surface, you will see some absorption. One of the cool tricks that I like for my phantoms, like especially if you're doing lots of SRS QA, if you want to use, one of the things is I'm a statistics freak. I love it. And so, <laughs> but the, the uncertainty is like the bane of my existence. And so when one of my physicists says, oh, I ran your same test and I get different numbers. I was like, well, what does your ROI look like? And we spend more time trying to troubleshoot why do you draw ROIs like this and that. And so the test is done. You can take a styrofoam head and if you go to a hobby place, find a low emissivity black paint. It's really flat. They paint the inside of hobby telescopes with it. It is virtually in invisible to the cameras. So anything you paint with it will not show up on your camera. If you're using, uh, we'll say the Align RT system. I have not tested this on like a C-RAD or a humetic system yet. Uh, but if you use this low emissivity paint, what we do is we basically outline an ROI on that phantom. You paint the whole phantom with this low emissivity paint, except for the area where the ROI is going to be, and you cannot make a mistake drawing that ROI. You literally take a reference with the phantom, and your ROI at your center, if I sent you my head that I use for, not my head, my... <laughs> Phantom head, that sounded really <laughs> terrible. Um, if I send you my head in a box, I, I probably didn't send it, so call the police. Um, uh, but if I sent you my phantom and, and you use that phantom, I can guarantee that your ROI will be the same size as my ROI. Yeah. And so if you have multiple institutions, doing things like that will, will standardize across multiple centers that that phantom, that ROI combination, because we know that the ROI sizes are somewhat of an artistic you know, gathering of tribal knowledge as you kind of go through the system. If you do that, you'd at least know the tests are one-to-one -one comparable. Because a, a lot of times when I look at tests, especially if I have a new physics person coming through or I, I, I do consulting work on the side and people send me all, like I said, hundreds of emails a week of like, hey, uh, you know, I saw this talk and you said this and I'm getting a different result. I spend more time troubleshooting how did you set this up to result in those numbers versus, oh, I think your numbers are right or wrong. Cause their numbers are what their numbers are. I have right. to trust that that physicist got true numbers. But the phantoms 
surfaces and the, the way you do things, the better you can control it, the more, the more you have reliable data, like Paul was talking about, of actually getting data that makes sense, that you can cross compare against other institutions. One of the things I'd like to see is any vendor uh, beginning to do kind of a standardization process for something like this, looking at here is a phantom, we will send it to you, you do X on it, send it back to us, and we will give you not just, yeah, you're good at localization, that's great. We all do IROC phantoms, we've all done the SRS phantom, at least probably should at some point if you're gonna do protocols. If you do that one, that's great, but they give you it as, you passed at 7% four millimeters. What does that mean to you? Did you get real lucky? I don't know, but 7% four millimeters, you'd have to be pretty bad not to pass that. What I'd really like to see is where do you exist in a population of patients? Yeah. So for SGRT, here's a phantom with this ROI that you can't screw up in any way, shape or form. Rotate it to each couch position, monitor for 10 minutes, send it in, they analyze the data with those data files and they can say, you're an OSMS customer, and your system is atypical. However it was installed is not the same as it was installed at this other site. There's really no benchmark out there right there for this. And we do this internally at our sites. Anytime I put a new system in, they run through the exact same test with the exact same fans. If I'm not doing it myself, it is so unbelievably controlled. And I had one system that had to be installed three times before it to pass those tests. But it was a system that was gonna be doing trigems and I'm like, I'm not willing to accept something that's kind of, I can't tell why it's wonky compared to all my other systems, we just re redo the apertures, redo the white balance, redo whatever you've got to do, but it's got to look like all my other systems because all my other systems have been tested. Yep. And so it's really going back to establishing really good baselines. If you have a good baseline and a good standardized test, every time you put in a new system, it better match that because it is the same cameras, it is the same phantom, it is the same. And, and I, I don't see that on the marketplace right now uh, anywhere. Yeah. And I think that would be invaluable, especially for technology like this, is that is not in everybody's wheelhouse. Um, just something to say, hey, is my, was my system installed correctly? Did I commission everything? And can you give me a sanity check? Where is my system? Is it in the 95th percentile? Is it sitting out here at the 60th percentile? You know, it's on, like we were talking about before, I don't know, I'm trying to look for the individual. You guys have protons, right? No, okay. Somebody, somebody was asking me. There she is. She's got protons. There she goes. So someone, gee, I'm sorry. You had glasses and dark jacket. I saw her earlier this morning. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just point you out randomly. She's back there hiding. Uh, she, if you have protons, protons is a completely different geometry, and you might not have CT scanning, or you might not have certain types of imaging that you used to on a Linux. How do you test that system without a standardized set of phantoms? that you can send back to somebody and say, is the system working correctly? Is the wonkiness due to the proton geometry or is it due to the fact that the system wasn't installed in the way I'd expect it? So, uh, for any vendors in the room. We should develop this. That's, yeah, exactly. That's, <laughs> I'll need 1% on that idea, okay? So, you just send me a royalty check. <laughs> or Jonathan, if you want to do it, we'll, we'll talk later. It's all good. Yeah. It was not uh, oil based. Yeah. Or, uh, actually, straight spray paint is dangerous on styrofoam. Yeah. 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 What kind of foundation did you use? <laughs> <laughs> was it Revlon or uh, is that even a thing? I don't even know if wow. that's a thing. It sounds. <laughs> this talk is going downhill. Now. Yeah, I know. It's just <laughs> quickly spiraling out of control at this point. Any other questions? But, but I love that idea of benchmarking. Um, again, I, you know, not to harp on it, but yeah, I'm traveling all over the world. I saw all these installations and the consistency was pretty shocking where, you know, just depending on the level of interest or who installed it versus that. And I think, you know, there's a market difference between, again, I'm not bashing anybody, it's just my experience, but but the Vision RT controlled systems versus some of the other ones in the wild. And um, yeah, I, I think being able to show those outliers is important. I think that's where our, all this QA, that's why we do it, right? I mean, the whole reason we're doing this is not to, I kind of talked about TG147 and it's kind of a, almost anecdotal. Like, they want you to check a box, but QA in general is not checking a box. It's a, it's a, it's a culture, right? Yeah. You want to establish something where there's a purpose to why you're doing it. You know, TG100, I wish it had more legs, I wish everybody did it across the whole world, but the, the, I don't. I, no, nobody does, <laughs> nobody does, nobody does. But the idea of just thinking like, what happens if, right? What, if this, then not. And just kind of thinking about why we're doing QA in, in general, so. The, the idea of QA is mostly to establish a 
comfort level for you as a clinician. Uh, I tell everyone the worst nightmare that I have, and it's like one of those, like I went to school naked nightmares, like when you had them in high school, like I show up and I've got no clothes on. Um, one of the things that I, I would hate to be in is in a clinical situation where I'm treating an SRS or a trigem or some sort of case and the physician looks at me and says, what does that mean? And I'm like, got me, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to be in that circumstance. You want to be able to characterize a system where you have a comfort level with the system, and that's what your QA should be developing for you, is some sort of comfort level with the system where you can answer a question. Back to our discussion last night about the protons, I, I don't have protons, so I don't have a comfort level with protons as far as what that means from a geometry of camera standpoint. But if, if I had one, my goal would be to get to a point where I could design a set of tests that if I ran into something clinically, I can answer that question. Right. As and physicists, yeah, we're put in that position a lot, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, things I we usually just make things up. Things know, we shouldn't have to answer. the planets. Yeah, and, that's right. <laughs> well, you're at the machine and the doctor says, are we okay? And you're like, you know, you have sure. to put your big boy pant, you go in there and actually answer that question. He's going well, and Like to Paul was saying, that. I think what he has, yeah. I, I will be doing that when I get back to my clinic. That's why I come to yeah. these meetings. Having a nice, because I know, I give my dosimetrist a, a chart saying, hey, if you have a posterior lesion that's this far, the, the distance between the surface and this isocenter is this far, you're going to be operating at the edge of the field of view at these couch kicks. Yeah. If, if we're not trying to avoid a previously treated area, let's not use those couch kicks so we know the system is being taxed in that area. Yeah. But I don't, I don't actually have a couch, kind of like a flex map at the machine where I could just quickly reference it and say, hey, at this one, I know I've got four tenths and it's at six tenths, and so I know the patient's only off by two tenths of a millimeter, which is within my one millimeter margin, let's just keep going. That's a great idea to just have that general reference there, and that comes from having lots of measurements. We have lot, lots of measurements, and I fell down on the documentation side of actually getting something like that to the machine. I think those types of things is what QA is designed to get you. We just made that, actually. That, that chart is now at our machine that we do SRS on, because yeah. we saw, again, we saw a little bit of a walk, and we knew the walk wasn't real because we did umpteen million Winston Lutz tests yeah. um, and we, we were able to quantify that so that we were able to say we see that little bit of an error we keep going we yeah. don't go back to zero and recomb beam because we know there's an inherent walk and that was you know do you want to give him the box I can't throw this mic that far <laughs> <laughs> you could but <laughs> I could but you may be injured <laughs> Are there any Versa users in the house? Versa. There, somebody had a Versa uh, yesterday at one of the talks, right? They're very, huh? Oh, they, yes, it may have been one of the British speakers had a, yeah, from the Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth. Um, are they here? Nope. Oh, okay. I'm getting the, no, they're gone. <laughs> oh, they're next door. Okay. <laughs> they're not gone. They're in Vegas. They're lost. <laughs> yeah, <No. that's> right. <laughs> Understandable. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've done a couple of things with Versa customers as far as the, the Align RT system. And if it's not, I always recommend before you start getting into SGRT QA that you make sure you really understand the machine side QA because like in my first talk, I don't know if I stressed it or not, but it, these are very much observer-based patterns. So a couch walkout and a patient motion is all viewed as one composite motion. So if you don't characterize like Paul was doing, characterize your couch walkout, there's no way to tease out what is a patient right. motion and what is a couch motion. Right. Uh, and that becomes more important on different platforms. I've, I've not done a Winston Lutz on a Versa, but I have an old Electa Synergy that it's Winston Lutz is awful. And it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, but the, the Winston Lutz on that machine, it, it just wasn't really well maintained and it's literally decommissioned. But when I was doing Winston Lutz on that one, that couch was, was relatively sloppy. And so if I would have surface guidance on that, surface guidance is gonna tell you, like Paul was showing you, what it sees. It doesn't distinguish, oh, that's a patient and that's your couch right. walkout. It just says the patient's not in the right position. So it is important. If, if, if you do have a Linac to actually characterize, do your 106 when you're commissioning, do your TG142, make sure you know all of that ahead of time before you add SGRT on top of that. Hey, Dor. Good. <laughs> Quick question for you. The, uh, do you, I missed the, the beginning of the, of the talk when um, 
in uh, in cases of trigem trigeminal, uh -huh. do you guys use uh, use uh, frameless or uh, or do you? Yeah, frame? we use just the SGRT system in a so, four millimeter cone. Okay, so in light of what Paul said, right now the the walk with with uh, with uh, with the couch kicks and things like that, and using four millimeter uh, like cones and things like that, don't you feel like? Uh, I mean, the uncertainty is going to be maybe point. Six millimeter, 0.5 millimeter. That's a quite a bit of uh, of uncertainty compared to the con compared to the cone size, and that I mean I, I don't know how you can combine the whole thing. The, this is only basically couch walk. If you combine other uncertainties in it, I'm pretty sure it's going to be close to one millimeter. Well, when you do a Winston Lutz test. Mm -hmm. You can we, we transfer a Winston Lutz test across cones and across MLCs as well on the same machine. So we'll do a reference cone and then we also do a cone centering routine that's optically showing you the equivalence between cones because you obviously aren't going to be able to do a Winston Lutz with a four millimeter cone, at least really effectively, given the pixel sizes of some of the portal imagers. But um, when we do that, it's, it's a 14 position Winston Lutz that then calculates the 3D positional accuracy of isocenter from that Winston Lutz. And that accuracy has to be under a half a mil total gantry, collimator, and couch. And so that's your total accuracy. When we commission a system, we're aware of those uncertainties that go into our planning. Uh, and if you saw earlier this morning, I gave the, uh, an example of one of our patients where we look for that uh, hyper intense nerve root uh, MR signal uh, afterwards. That's how we build our confidence that that's what's going on, essentially. We did a ton of end-to-end -end tests on film and all of that with our four millimeter cone, and we were like, we are smack dab right in the middle of this thing using optical guidance only, no cone beam. So if cone beam adds you know, an extra two tenths of accuracy, we're gonna, obviously we're not gonna just go with no cone beam for trigems, but we'll do the cone beam, and then we're looking, when we're, we're starting a program, we're looking for stuff like that saying, yeah, we hit it. The same thing, that four millimeter fourth ventricular met that I showed this morning. I mean, that thing was center punched. There was no radiographic scarring on the brainstem at all. Those are really good cases to do good follow up on and look at, say, you know, end to end on a phantom is great. End to end on a patient is better. And so we try to do those types of follow ups to just make sure that all of because I mean, all of those uncertainties are going to add in quadrature. And at the end, you don't. Is that a millimeter? Is that something? And at some point, you have to kind of step off the ledge and say, I've done as much from a physics standpoint that I've done commissioning and all of this to say that the system is ready to go. When you put it on a patient, I don't put it on a patient and just willfully um, decide to not follow up on that. I, I like to see those types of, so that's why I say when, when you're evaluating for an SGRT system, that's why that is so important to go to a site that can show you, anybody can tell you it has, a, I went to a site that says, yeah, we're using system X and I won't say what system it was, system X for SRS. And I went there and they literally do a cone beam they turn on the system and completely disregard it. They might as well put it in the closet. But it's on during the SRS, so they're performing SRS with the system. And that's not that. You, you can go to a center and see, I'm doing SRS or I'm doing tri jumps, and here's the end result of the process you just saw. That's why it's so important to do those types of things because, again, the, the gray area of QA is, if it's on, am I using it, and is that really true? Right. Um, just turning it on during an SRS and not relying on it to do the positional stuff like what Paul was showing during his talk that is trusting the system, not just I turned it on and I saw a walkout, so I disregarded it. And you, you need to dig into those QA issues and determine if those are real. And then how does that translate to a patient? Well, was a great point you brought up, too, is that, you know, you can't always combine tests, right? You can't, you can't always solve the problem with the end-to-end. -end. The end-to-end -end is there to kind of illustrate the overall big picture. If you see issues, you have to start diving into the individual components of what that system is. Yeah. Going back to a trigen, you're absolutely right. Couch walk is absolutely important. So you have to mechanically now go back to that and establish what's happening in that system. And I think that's an exact, you know, exact point you're trying to make, so. Savas has got a question. Okay. <laughs> the question is for Mike, because I think of all of us in this room, you would probably want to see all of these things that they can get here today. Uh -huh. Tomorrow might be a fourth and a fifth, and the fifth. But I'm talking about the three and three are going to go all third off after today. Mike, Are we 
Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave now. <laughs> I was going to say, thanks for the question. Um, I really don't know how aligned they're going to be as far as a, an established benchmark. I don't know how much they have to be aligned. I, I think that all the systems are making fundamental design decisions that are independent to them. I mean, I'm sure Vision RT does not call up and consult CRED and CRED does not call up and consult Varian to say, how are you going to do this? They're going to do it their own way. I, I think the, the benchmarking of those systems or a, an acceptable standard can be kind of imposed from the community. Um, we do very similar things with IROC when we, we're talking about uh, the IROC phantoms. Here is a phantom. We don't care what you have. Tell us what you have. And you do the phantom and you send it back to us. One of the things I think needs to happen is, in, in the case of IROC, it's very, left up, it's very much left up to artistic interpretation. It's kind of a loose criteria, so kind of everyone gets to do protocols. I, it, when protocols aren't on the line, I really think that we can tighten up those criteria. And we can also say, here is a plan with a DICOM data set that has a structure surface and targets and all that, and it's also going to be delivered. You're going to deliver this plan, import it in your planning system. All we want you to do is calculate this plan. We don't want you to come up with a plan. We don't want you to come up with your own arc arrangements or whatever. We want you to turn on your system. And I think where the alignment would have to come in is, you know, I'm sure Vision RT, they export their data in, in, in a format that's pretty easy to get to. Uh, I, I know that Humetic, or now Varian Identifier, whatever they're calling it these days, um, actually has a pretty user-friendly way of getting the data out of the system. Uh, I'm not for, you, you have CRED, correct? No. Somebody had CRED at one point. Nobody's going to admit to it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I thought somebody had wow. CRED last night. Okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to just point at you because I just keep picking on you. Um, <laughs> but somebody had CRED at one point, and I, I forgot to ask them. I'm not really familiar with how they exported data. So the, kind of the alignment would be how do we get the data out of the system? But if you can deliver a phantom with a structure that you're going to track, and then you, instead of saying it's a pass fail on a 3% 3 millimeters, 3% 2 millimeters, whatever it is, you could have a dosimetric passing rate, mm -hmm. but you could also have that output from the data and say, how well was this tracked at these standard couch angles? And, I, and it's, it's largely independent of the data or ind independent vendor, of the, yeah. the vendor at that. Yeah. So, and if you have a phantom that says this is an ROI, if you're not an ROI based system, here's a standard by which we're going to measure it. You, the community can come up with those and then just say, okay, everyone who has this system, here's a hundred people and you're in this area of, of that distribution. And I, I think that would be valuable. And then over time, you could start comparing those statistically of, okay, if you're within this area and you're delivering the dose, this becomes the standard of, okay, here are the leverage effects, here's the uncertainties you're dealing with, with this system, with this pre-established ROI, whether, I mean, if you're not using an ROI-based system, painting an ROI so it's a standard on a phantom all the time would be, but it, you can start developing criteria for cross-comparing vendors that don't require the vendors to participate. Um, Uh, Very far away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't believe APM is anywhere close. There is the TG three hundred two. I yeah. plan on attending the the three hundred two uh, task group report meeting uh, in July at double APM to kind of see where they're at. I've been kind of ghost helping along with the the protocol, but there, there is literally no recommendations in there for that right now. Right. Thanks, no guys.